to the hideout. Welcome to First Tuesdays. Uh, we took last month off, That's correct. and uh, we're really glad to be back. We're really glad to see this great crowd here. So um, a lot of crazy stuff is happening around here, but we're glad all of you guys are here. So let's just start off with a round of applause for being here. All right. I'm Mick Dumkey. I'm a reporter for the Sun Times, and my co-host yeah, Ben Jarofsky from the Reader. Um, and uh, before we uh, bring our outstanding guests, uh, well, they're already up here. So before <laughs> before we allow them to speak, um, I just want to let you know that Mick and I were very busy uh, in the month that we took off from the hideout, uh, building a website. Uh, which is still under construction. Um, I think that the Paul Basketball Arena will be built before our website is finished. But it, at least we won't waste any TIFF money on it. Um, so the website is called, what's it called, Mick? Do you remember the website? First then? Tuesday. That's, the, that's, the, that's really, but I won't, I won't make you answer that. It's FirstTuesdaysChicago.com. Yes. So if you go there as we speak, you'll see like a website. There, under there is something there. <laughs> there is something there. It's and like and a, a few of our stuff. own old shows, um, which yes. we'd like to think are still very fresh. Um, and uh, so please check it out. And hopefully we'll get our act together yes. and keep adding more stuff. Um, we had a great, the last time we were here, we had a great conversation uh, or at least a very interesting conversation with Steve Brown, who is the longtime spokesman for House Speaker Michael Madigan, and uh, Natasha Karecki, uh, former colleague of uh, Carol's and briefly of mine, um, who now writes for Politico, and, um, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, so I'm talking about it, but it's not actually on the site no, yet. And one I won't, day soon. I won't <laughs> blame Ben for the fact that... Uh, we wanted him to get up today, but he can turn around and blame me because I was supposed to get the thing on YouTube, yeah. whatever, right. et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it's in the It'll works. be up there, so please keep checking that out and, and keep checking back. And don't be alarmed um, if you start getting emails from us. I think my sister has in the past collected some of your email addresses. That's my sister, the one waving, um, otherwise known as, as Kat. And um, she may be passing this around. If you're interested in coming back or getting updates, we actually do intend to get our act together here. So we'll be sending out a newsletter and other information along the way. Uh, we promise not to solicit any campaign contributions for any of Bruce Rauner's funds uh, with your email address. So don't worry about that. Um, all right, Ben, any other housekeeping stuff before we no, get to the No, let's get right to it. we got two outstanding guests. That's right. All right, and let's, uh, Tim, Somewhere in there, I think Tim introduced them briefly, but let's uh, formally introduce them again. Um, at the far end of the table, um, on the far left, although I'm not saying that's your politics, Marianne, <laughs> um, but Marianne Ahern, the uh, longtime political reporter for NBC5, is here for her second appearance yeah. with us. And immediately uh, next to me, between Ben and I, is uh, Carol Marine, um, who uh, doesn't need any introduction, but has done so many things in journalism for so long, forget to list them all, but currently is uh, at NBC5, as well as Chicago Tonight on WTTW. So thanks to both of you for being here. Before we start talking um, about all the goings on and what they mean and all that fun stuff, we we like to sort of, um, even though people know you guys, very recognizable, you're public figures, they are people out here rely on you to stay informed. We also, you know, like to tell them a little bit or ask you to tell them a little bit about who you are, why you're still doing this. And Marianne, we took you through this. We asked you to go through this before, but for for folks who weren't here. Um, how did you end up, up, not up here necessarily, but how did you end up doing what you're doing? <laughs> well, I actually have Carol to thank for being in Chicago. But uh, So I first started out as a high school English teacher. Uh, was here in Chicago, two different high schools. Yay, yay. <laughs> Gordon Tech in the city and then New Trier. And decided that I really wanted to go after my goal of being a journalist. Went to Northwestern and trying to speed up this story. But Peoria to Atlanta while I was in Atlanta covering the 1988 campaign 
ran into one Carol Moraine on the campaign trail, and I said, I want to work with you. I'm going to send you my tape. And believe it or not, that did start get the ball rolling. I ran into her on a story, and several months later, I ran into Paul Hogan, a former reporter at NBC. And when the two of them mentioned to the news director, it, it didn't happen right like that, but it took uh, almost a year. But thankfully, Thelma and Louise were together. <laughs> now, now, who is now who actually coined the? Because I think each of you have have referred to your collective entity is Thelma and Louise. Robert Gibbs, Barack Obama's <laughs> first press secretary at the convention where Obama was accepting the nomination for the first time. Robert Gibbs came upon us as we were getting ready for a live shot before the then to be president's speech and Gibbs looks at Marianne and he looks at me and he goes, <laughs> Thelma and Louise. <laughs> he didn't mean it as a compliment, but, <laughs> but we all. really took it as a compliment, <laughs> and we have embraced it yeah. ever since. Yeah. Well, Carol, how did you end up at this esteemed joint drinking uh, whatever white wine they serve at the bar here? <laughs> Because you called me. There you that, go. That's why. Like Marianne, I'm a former English teacher, uh, but I was always a news addict, and uh, I ended up auditioning on a dare for a talk show in Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, the guy came out to who was doing the auditions and said, honey, you just sit right down there, and you are going to interview a famous film director, <laughs> or cameras, all of that. And I said, "Is it real? am I really going to be inter interviewing someone like that? Well, of course not. It was some guy in the back who brought out, his name was Albert Smith. He was a devout Christian. And Albert Smith did not want to torture the women who were auditioning the way they wanted him to. And so we whispered, honey, I'm not going to answer any of your questions. They like to see you girls squirm. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I didn't even really want this job. <laughs> So the camera came on, and I said, I'd like you to meet Albert Smith. He's a pornographer. <laughs> well, Albert Smith was so horrified, as a good Christian man, from being called pornographer, he started to talk. <laughs> and they hired me to do, to do uh, talk shows in Knoxville, Tennessee, but I was a failure because I was beaten by Ladies' Day with Margie on the competing station because... I refused to do what they called a woman's talk show, and I had brought the Klan on in full gear and a bunch of other things, and Margie was doing more makeup and homecoming queens, and they said, she is never gonna work out. Send her to the newsroom. I went to the newsroom. I developed a prison beat, which also nobody wanted to have, um, but it established some seriousness, I hoped. I ended up from Knoxville to Nashville to Chicago, then quitting Chicago, going to CBS Network for a while, then coming back to NBC. That's the long and short of it. Right. And by the way, she's Thelma, and I'm Louise. Yeah, right. Well, uh, then if she's Thelma, you're Louise, who's the Brad Pitt character? That would be Don Mosley, who's our producer back here. Uh, we'll take Don. All right, I guess you guys forgot some of the great scenes in that movie uh, involving Brad Pitt, which we will... Uh, just not mention and move on to other things. That's right. I think I'm the only one who's actually seen the movie recently. Um, so uh, we'll start with you, Carol. Uh, having just discussed that uh, evolution that got you to Chicago, you've been here for a while. Uh, is this moment in Chicago political history uh, unique in any way in terms of the level of corruption, deceit, and... Uh, uh, that seems to be playing out on don't, a daily don't basis. Don't forget yeah. disarray. Disarray. Yeah. Or uh, is this unique, or is it more or less more the same of the last 20 or so years that you've been here? What do you, what do you think? Is this something as a special moment? First of all, can I just thank the mayor for being here tonight? <laughs> no, I was teasing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's hiding in the back. Someone is back there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, she did didn't say that. <laughs> I don't think there has been a moment like this in Chicago. It's sort of, you know, it, it's re reached a kind of critical mass. I mean, Marianne and I have, have seen 
a lot of things over time, going from, you weren't here for Jane Byrne's election, but Jane Byrne, Harold Washington, scandals, John Burge, you know, all the combustible moments of politics, and then corruption and police issues, but never like this. And today, when you open up the newspaper and see that you're dealing with questions that the mayor's being asked to answer, the police department, the corporation council, the independent police authority, uh, you know, the, the state's attorney's office, I think this is a kind of critical mass moment. Do you agree with that? Oh my goodness. It, it, you know what it, it reminds me of somewhat, uh, just in my personal experience of covering, it's the priest abuse of the archdiocese. Oh. It's very similar. Yeah. You know, I did that in 1991 when everyone did the, wasn't me, I didn't see it, you know, tell someone else, you know, it, it reminds me a lot of that. And the same sort of moral questions of why didn't anyone ever say, I, who cares? You know, I get it that there's a contract, and yes, we're part of a union, and, and you, you know, I would want to uphold any contract. But when someone does something egregious as shooting someone 16 times and they didn't, no one said anything and didn't say, wait a second, we got to do something quicker about this, it's a lot like the priest abuse of what went on. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, it's, it's funny you said we were just talking about before. Uh, all of us have seen the movie Spotlight. I don't know if everybody here has seen Spotlight, but... Uh, that tells the story of uh, how some reporters from the, um, uh, the Boston Globe uh, uh, didn't uncover pr uh, police case incidences of priests molesting children so much as the archdiocese working in conjunction with the political establishment, the, the courts, the police, et cetera, to cover it up. Even the Boston Globe was complicit at some point. Um, so how far do you think this cover-up goes? Well, first of all, do you think that it's a cover-up? Is, is cover-up an appropriate way to describe what's going on and, and, and why? Because I've heard some debate about this. Do you think there is has been a cover-up to keep the video under wraps, to change the narrative? Explain what you mean, cover-up. How could you not think that there wasn't some form of cover-up? I mean, and the emails that were released on New Year's Eve at what, nine in the morning, you know, 3,000, here, take a look at them. I mean, if that didn't confirm, and I've only read, I can't even say how many, you know, maybe 40 or 50, there are 3,000 of them. If that doesn't tell you that there was some orchestration of how to uh, defend what they were up, then, then you must be in a cave. The problem, I mean, so we can argue the legalism of cover-up, yeah. you know, until it's proven in a court of law if it ever gets to that point. But when you talk about people who had knowledge, had knowledge from the moment, the moment that Laquan McDonald was shot and killed, or shortly thereafter, the police department understood what it had. There were police officers not attached to that investigation in the Burger King across the street running through the video, with asking the manager who was being a good citizen, giving them the passcode to see what they had on it, Gary McCarthy admitted that within hours, the police department, it wasn't just Pat Camden of the union saying that the offender, uh, Laquan McDonald, in their view, had, had gone after the police officer. It was the police department that formalized it in a press release saying that the officer discharged his weapon because the offender was coming toward him. So they knew, and McCarthy said he knew, ultimately, that that was in error, was not true, but didn't rescind it, was trying to work behind the scenes. So what do you call such a thing? Well, well, yeah, let's, let's, brief, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's briefly go back because, um, and I don't want to spend the whole time we have up here going over every minute detail of what's happened because I think we're all still sifting through the information ourselves and we, we do this professionally, but a lot was released even over the last week and a half, two weeks, when a lot of folks were on holiday. And as you mentioned, Marianne, just, just in case people didn't pick up on this, first of all, on Christmas Eve, the uh, Mayor Manuel's administration released uh, audio recordings of all the police dispatches no, go in the incident. The day Thanksgiving. after Thanksgiving, right. 458 pages were released at 6 o'clock at night, and when we got the email, it said you only have a few minutes to go pick it up, otherwise you have to wait till Monday. That's right. 
And that was on, you know, the Friday after Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving weekend. Then Christmas Eve is the audio recordings are released um, in, in a sort of a haphazard fashion. And then, as Marianne mentioned, on uh, New Year's Eve um, at, at, at 9 a.m., you had to queue up, basically, and you had a short window to pick up a CD-ROM of 3,000 pages of emails spanning um, more than a year, a calendar year, of administration conversations about the incident, some of which, by the way, were blacked out, um, even, even with the mask. So, so there was all this stuff, and, and all of our, I think, news organizations were half-staffed because of the holiday, and we had to pull it all together. But my point is that a lot of stuff was released. So let's very briefly at least go back, OK? So this, everyone, I'm sure, has, has everyone seen the video at this point in time? OK. <laughs> Um, well, some people haven't, I, you know, whatever. Uh, hey, but Rom hasn't. Rom, that's right. <laughs> the mayor still maintains he hasn't seen it. So October 20th, there's a police call, right? There's a 911 call that someone is breaking into a truck yard down at uh, 40th, 40th and Pulaski. And a police car responds, and you hear these audio, the, the audio conversation, the 911 dispatcher to me, it sounded so routine, he almost was rude to the, to the caller, like it was such a non-urgent situation. And, and then the police, the, the police that respond initially sound very calm about it. There's this guy, he's walking down the street, he's carrying a knife, does anybody have a taser? And you have all these uh, repeated calls by the responding officer and by the dispatcher, does anybody out there have a taser? Can anyone respond to this with a taser? And then it's like within a few seconds it goes from, and then you hear uh, another, uh, several other cars saying they're responding, including one including that um, contains Officer Van Dyke. And within a few seconds it goes from calm to, you know, shooting, shooting. I forget the exact language, but it's basically like officer, you know, officer shooting. And um, so it just kind of explodes. All right. So I guess pick it up from there, you guys. What what's sort of the important stuff that has happened? along the way and that and that wasn't that you know that was kind of slow to unfold about this. Well first of all you're hearing the nine one one calls from OEMC. You're not hearing anything from the squads. And the reason you're not is they don't have their audio on. And, and some of them the, the cameras in the car. The cameras in the cars that are supposed to be fully um, sound available, video available. So there are only a couple of working cameras, apparently no working audio, and so, and that's not how it's supposed to be in the regulations, and those cameras are, are equipped to do those kinds of things. And so Laquan McDonald, all the officers, except for one, exhibit restraint. They are looking for tasers. Why they don't have tasers is another one of the mysteries of this, but no one shot but one officer. He was only on the scene 30 seconds, and began shooting six seconds after he got out of the car. And so we know those things. And the reason we even know that there was a video, and this is credit where credit is due, Jamie Calvin of the Invincible Institute and Craig Futterman of the University of Chicago Justice Center are the ones who got a tip. And they got a tip from someone inside who thought what was happening was so reprehensible that it had to be known. So God bless whoever that person is. And so because of their work, they begin to ask questions. City Hall knows easily that those questions are being asked in November, December. Jamie Calvin has an article in Slate in February. So this, this thing is Which rolling. Which is what time frame? Before the mayor's election. Yeah. That's right. So in the, the mayor's election is ramping up in October. It's already contentious. It goes to a runoff. We don't know formally about the settlement, the $5 million settlement without a lawsuit ever being filed until just days after the runoff decides the election in favor of the mayor and Steve Patton, the Corporation Council, goes to the Finance Committee of City Council and says, we need you to approve $5 million in a settlement. There's a video. The video will show that the officer shot and that the young man did not lunge at him. That he was, in fact, walking away from the officer at the time of the... Yeah, so in other words, that's why... I, I, <laughs> that goes back to the original point, which, of course, is that 
what we, what we see in the video refutes the official explanation for what happened. So the mayor and his chief advisors had to have known that as soon as, give him the benefit of the doubt, as soon as mid-November. Well, the police chief knew. The superintendent of police knew. Okay, well, he would be within, constitute a chief advisor with, to with, the mayor. Within hours. But here's something, and, and there is an argument in police training for this. When someone has a knife, the argument is within 20 to 25 feet, someone with a knife can take it and throw it. And if their aim is good enough, they can get you. And so the argument is you have to disarm. <laughs> well, we're, we're telling you what's in the police, police training and we're what telling, police so, rules in any case, allow. Okay. In, whatever. Okay. okay well, the, po the point is that, um, as we understand it, that uh, basically, if, if a police shooting, first of all, there is wide latitude under both Chicago Police Department rules and court rulings up to the U.S. Supreme Court that give officers, you know, a lot of room to use deadly force if they need to. But and we, we don't we, have to like we, it, but that we, is the fact. But let me just add point. that. That so, even if one accepted that, if you do, fine. If you don't, fine. But <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> the, <laughs> the The fact is that 16 shots would seem to do more than disable someone. And so, even if one accepted that logic, then could you have disabled, dropped uh, the young man, shot him in the leg, and not killed him? Okay. That's okay. I, I mean, I think I think a valid point is being raised here because you know you're you're taught that if you have to fire a gun in a deadly situation, then you don't aim for the kneecaps. You have to, if you you only fire the gun is if there's a life or death situation, um, a, a threat, and you have to fell the person. Basically, that is what the training is in a nutshell. And um, and and you're not supposed you know you're not supposed to fire otherwise. And if you do, you have to make sure that it counts. Um, frankly. That, that's, that's essentially what the training says. Um, now, I've talked to several police officers who said to me, you know, if, if he'd been shot twice, we wouldn't be here talking about that. What do you, what do you guys think about that? I, I agree. I totally agree. If you had been shot twice, maybe even three, we wouldn't have been here. But that, that, the whole bottom line is we're here because of the 16 shots and because there was the cover that no one said anything. It could have been used as a teachable moment. It could have been used as the mayor saying, oh, my goodness, you know, this is not going to work. We're not going to have someone in our department like this. And, you know, come at me later with a suit for firing him before just cause. But guess what? We got to deal with this. But guess what was going on at the time? Ferguson. Um, what other cities? But, you know, it, uh, those things were on his mind. Baltimore. They were on his mind. I, they had to be. They weren't just on his mind. They were on a lot of city leaders' minds. And you have to wonder if perhaps they were thinking, mm, we can't really deal with this right now. And who knows what might happen. And oh my goodness, my election's coming up in February. Yeah. I, I, well, first of all, I think we're here. I mean, literally, we'd be here anyway. If, <laughs> but um, You would. Yeah, we would. Yeah, I don't know if you guys would be here. But um, I think this is an issue be not because of the 16 uh, bullets so much as the fact that it was videotaped. And so again, we could see that the official didn't match. The, the explanation of what happened did not match what we saw. So now we're in a position where we have to ask our mayor, well, why didn't you tell us that the official explanation did not match what is on the video? And the mayor's response, uh, well, seems to be a work in progress, uh, depending on when you talk to him. But as, as near as I can tell, it's that uh, I didn't want to, uh, this is what it's evolved into, I think, right? My, my agreement, I'm the latest, if anything's yeah. changed, that I didn't want to uh, interrupt an investigation. Uh, is, is that the official response? What he said is he was doing, following the procedures that have always been followed. Do you, do you think that wasn't true? Do you think he was? doing anything different from what has been done with police shootings um, in the past? Forget about police shootings. Go to John Burge. Go, you know, go way back and say, if there had been videotape in John Burge's era, and that was years 
of activity. There, that would be an entirely different story. But we didn't see black suspects in Area 2. And so, and was there a code of silence? Uh, there was. And so the police department settled and settled and settled on Burge. And, and codes of silence if, if, don't just apply to police situations or at least police officers engaged in, uh, in the use of force. The David Koshman story that the Sun-Times has reported now for years was another code of silence. It was another cover-up. And it was a protected class. It was a clouded class. This is Mayor, uh, Mayor Daly's nephew. R.J. Van Echo, who, drunk on Rush Street, uh, with uh, encountering a bunch of kids from Mount Prospect, they got into an altercation. It was one punch. David Koshman fell to the ground. There's no question, I don't think, that anyone intended to kill anyone, but somebody got killed. And, uh, and that was covered over, stories changed, documents disappeared, files gone in the, um, the state's attorney's office. That was another kind of thing. And of this was not to protect uh, a police officer. No, no. Uh, this was to protect the nephew of the mayor. And this were, these were police officers protecting the nephew of the mayor or their jobs or whatever they felt they needed to protect. And yeah. that probably was done without necessarily an, an order. That was that was regular, right? Regular business. Yeah. We'll see now. Okay. Here's the difference: Kochman versus this case. Um, this case has led us into the mayor's office. This case has moved, it, it's like the water, I'm also old, I'm probably the only guy in the room, Watergate, if you remember Watergate, what the president knew when he knew it. This has actually led into the mayor's office to determine, as you were suggesting, did he conceal important evidence because he wanted uh, the issue not to clutter his reelection campaign. Do you think the mayor, the mayor buried Evidence in order to uh, get by, keep it buried and hidden for the election. I can't. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. And I think one of the jobs of a reporter is until you know, you don't know. Um, what, did people around the mayor know that this was a problem case? I think the emails demonstrate that they do, and we've been reporting on those emails since May. Um, are, do they have an awareness of it? Yes. Do they also have an awareness of Ferguson and some of the other events that are lighting up this country in terms of police and, and usually black citizens? Yes. And if you are the mayor of a city, do you want to keep the lid on any sort of violence? You do. So I'm not going to say that I know until I do, but I think the questions that we continue to raise about this, is your car okay? <laughs> oh no! Did did you stop them? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's clout. That's clout. <laughs> did you know them? <laughs> that's why they were towing me. <laughs> Was the mayor involved? <laughs> As I told you, they like to follow me. <laughs> I mean, I do think we have to be judicious about this, um, and 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 keep piecing it together. It's peeling the onion. That's what we're doing. That's what we'll keep doing. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the mayor uh, has successfully uh, thrown a roadblock uh, in, in front of the media uh, by dumping all those emails? Uh, what was it? What was it? 9 a.m. on the New Year's Eve? At least no, it was 9 no. a.m. No, yeah. not at all. Okay. I think the I mean, and the national media is really having it great heyday with them. You know, oh my goodness. They have been saving and saving, yeah. waiting for this moment. I mean, some of these folks must have been had a diary on the guy for yeah. a while, you know. The New Yorker piece, the Washington Post, I mean, they've just been waiting for this one. But no, not at all. I think, in fact, that the media feels more, you know, bold, I, you know, kind of like, aha, see, we knew it. Yeah. <laughs> it's that whole thing of transparency. The, the idea of dumping it the day after Thanksgiving Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve. I mean, 
that's so transparent in itself. I mean, you know, the hope, the hope that nobody's home to receive the, you know, the, the box of documents. Yeah, I nobody mean, paying attention. If we don't report on it this day, we will go through it for tomorrow. Well, I can't, I can't say that no one saw our story about the audio calls um, that came out on Christmas Day because we had people calling to complain that we put the story in the paper and said, "This is Christmas. What are you doing putting that out there?" Oh my goodness. So, hey, and I don't think they were all from Rom, um, either, <laughs> all the calls. The other, you know, the other thing on the national media front, um, in some ways you have to uh, give his staff credit because they sensed the importance of keeping oh, the national media in their corner. If everyone remembers, yeah. in the early days of when Rom first came into office, you know, there was a column in the New York Times yeah like every other week, oh, okay. about how great he was yeah. doing. Thomas Friedman, oh God, um, your, your, your good friend David Brooks. Uh, ben doesn't like David Brooks. That's a joke. Um, you know, they were all, they were all sort of uh, just raving about how great Ron was doing, and we're like, he's been in there for three weeks. No, like, was, how, no, how I, can you I, do so? The, 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 uh, the national coverage of Ron as mayor was embarrassing, in my humble opinion. Uh, and then there was a moment uh, where the, uh, the national media, uh, speaking collectively, uh, you know, uh, sc sort of came, uh, became aware that people in Chicago didn't like Rahm as much as they did. And uh, <laughs> I think that was in some time after he had closed 50 schools with, uh, you know, uh, with that horrendous process he had that was doctored to make it seem like it was fair. So then, I don't know. It seems as though now it's payback time for having... Right. And, you know. and in these emails that were, again, dumped on uh, New Year's Eve, you see over and over again his aides obsessing over all the media coverage, but in particular, when it's the New Yorker, when it's the New York Times, they are really freaking out, you know? Well, and then enlisting their old Clinton buddies to be surrogates. That's right. To speak to the national media, to give out, the, you know, their, their side of the story, yeah. And then even at one point in one of the emails, uh, you know, the, the, uh, Adam Collins with the, with the mayor's office, why does the New York Times care? You know, why, you know, why, are, they, why are they asking? Yeah. You know, like, yeah. gee, yeah. Uh, how could yeah. you... How could you think at this point that, that everyone, you know, come on, it's not just a little Mayberry here. A lot of people care. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, one, one guy who's happy about all this, even though he says he's been crying about it, is our governor, oh, yeah. I believe, uh. um, who, um, you know, has, 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 hasn't missed uh, that many opportunities to sort of, uh, you know, just, exp I think yesterday expressed his disappointment, right? I um, wonder what your, your guys, your, your take on the, uh, the, the governor and, and him weighing in on this. I mean, obviously, it seems like crocodile tears. He literally said the one time that he was, he was crying. Didn't he say he was crying for Laquan McDonald? Yeah. And then he was crying for the police. Yeah, he was too, crying for everybody. Argentina, the whole bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh. you know, I don't know what I believe about this, though, because Bruce Rauner and Rahm Emanuel have been friends. Bruce Rauner helped Rahm Emanuel become very wealthy. The two of them, I think, may not ag agree on certain kinds of economic policies or other kinds of policies, but I do think that they have a certain mindset that, that merges. And so I always wonder in the theater of politics if sometimes people pretend not to like each other um, rather than honestly don't like each other anymore. So, you know, the jury's out for me on whether you know, they're, the bromance is over, and 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 they're not friends. I just kind of want to wait. Well, do you have any theories on this, uh, uh, Rob and Robert? I, you know, right now it's survival of the fittest, and so why not? You know, that, that he wants to look as if, the governor wants to look as if, you know, oh, my moment to go after him, you know. And yet, I totally agree with Carol. I think it's it's rather, you know, timely, but I still think the two end up in Montana on another vacation together. <laughs> See, nobody believes, this is where we've come in Chicago, nobody believes anything <laughs> that officials said. They, like the man said he cried, okay? Nobody believes he cried. <laughs> nobody believes that Rom didn't look at the video. I mean, nobody believes anything. I, I, I have to say that this, the Rauner thing is an unusual um, flip. I was talking to Mick about this earlier today. Um, I can't recall in the last 20 years or so that a prominent uh, Republican official 
uh, in the state or anywhere, but let's stick with the state, has cited, uh, if you will, on a, on a matter of a police shooting um, with the black community as opposed to with the police. I, and so, like, the political dynamics of that, I'm just still absorbing, you know? Like, what does this mean? Does this, is this part of Rauner's attempt to try to, like, get Ken Duncan reelected as state rep? And, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, Ken Duncan is the Democrat who voted with Rauner, you know? I, I guess some people in this audience know who he is. And um, <laughs> he's been on the stage, by the way. Um, is it his attempt to, uh, you know, curry favor with uh, Reverend Meeks, who's an appointee on the school board, uh, the state school commission, so they could do more charter who, schools. Who, by, who, by the way, um, once, uh, you know, created a, a big media event by talking about how he was racially profiled in a traffic stop. Do you remember yes, that? Yes, I do remember that, um, yeah. Years ago. But in, in yeah, so, so that's my are. point. I've yeah. never, I, it's like an interesting dynamic, you yeah. know. Yeah. So is he trying to peel Democratic voters away from the Democrats? I mean, there's the, only one word, Mike, or two words, Mike yeah. Madigan. <laughs> so whatever, whatever the objective here, it is to separate Mike Madigan right. from the solution that the governor thinks is the best solution, which is his solution, and so. If Rahm Emanuel isn't on board with Rauner, then is he on board with Madigan? I mean, this is all the triangulation of power in Springfield as far as, as I can see. And can you imagine that Mike Madigan's ever going to call the recall bill for a vote? So it's safe for Rauner to say, oh, you bet I'll sign that recall bill. A recall bill that might never make it anywhere, yeah, but right. yeah, well, we'll see. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Is there any chance, um, first of all, that this is legislation that uh, LaShawn Ford, Westside State Rep, has introduced that would basically allow for recall provision for the Chicago mayor? Nothing like this exists. I don't think there's any recall for any statewide elected officials either, right? Um, think, aren't there some there in the suburbs? I think no, there, no. there. I'm not sure. I thought there were some mechanisms, but I'm. But okay, I can't but not not for this, not for the mayor of Chicago, yeah. not for statewide elected officials. Um, so this is a this is a big deal, and obviously it's timed with the Rom stuff. Um, Wait, there is after Blagojevich, there was a recall, but the thresholds are so enormous. I mean, you need 800,000 signatures. You need to get it on the ballot. I mean, even if you pass this kind of legislation. You can't jump the high hurdles to, it's, to it's get really it done. It's really difficult. Well, the the what I was laboring toward here was: um, is there really any chance that Rahm Emanuel resigns, gets removed? Um, a lot of people are cheering for that. Is there any chance? No. No. No way. So why are people talking about it like it's I a don't rally? Say the national no way. the national media is talking about it like it's <clears throat> a distinct possibility. I don't say no way just yet. I mean, I I think it's highly unlikely. But as the Justice Department begins its investigation, and it, now we see that really they should go beyond, of course, the police department to the law department after yeah. what happened yesterday. Yeah. So as all of this gets rolling, um, you know, is it going to happen next week? No. Could it be a year? He has three and a half years left. Will he serve three and a half years of his term? I think, I'm, who knows? Yeah. I, 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 yeah, Bernie, <laughs> Bernie Sanders, yeah. Um, yeah, I. Uh, that, that would be Bernie Sanders, not Bernie Stone. No. Um, <laughs> may he rest in peace. Um, uh, boy, he looks pretty good these days, doesn't he, Bernie Stone? Um, for Chicago politicians, um, I, uh, I, I, I agree with you. I, I, I don't know where this is going. I, and you know, that's that dumping of the emails, which clearly are not all the emails. Uh, I'm sure there's, they were selective. <laughs> they. they Let's think about how many emails they have. You yeah. know, they, they issue three thousand. There's probably three thousand more out there. People just go. What are they going to go after? Text messages next. You know, because Mayor well, Rahm's I, I, a big yeah. texter, yeah. so they're going to go after the text messages. And uh, so, to me, the issue has always been: Will the Obama Justice Department uh, have the guts to pursue this investigation, even if it, they know it goes? to the top floor of City Hall where their guy is sitting, okay? Um, I still believe, I may be the only guy in Chicago who believes this, that the Bush administration pulled 
the plug on their investigation of the city hall scandals of the mid O's, which people probably have already forgotten, before it got to Mayor Daley. I've always believed that. So, well, there um, was that famous picture of uh, the of President then President Bush come flying in on his birthday his to birthday, dine with Mayor with Daley. Daley. That's, that's my birthday. What do I want to do? I want to yeah. have dinner with yeah. Mayor Daley. Yeah. So right. if we see Obama flying in, you know, at Manny's to have wasn't that at the, beef Wasn't that Rob? at the Firehouse Restaurant? Yes, it was at the Firehouse yeah. Restaurant, yes. Which is, of course, owned by the same operation that owns the Park Grill, yeah, which or, has been all Or owned of, it, I, yeah, it so it, it all yeah. comes together. Anyway, um, yeah. So, yeah, corruption cover-ups are just part of the as, fabric. As, someone, as someone once said to Ben and I, when we, we wrote, we wrote a, a story, of, it was like an election preview about who was getting contributions from who, who is, who's daughter or nephew or whatever who was who was you know slated without an election to be installed into office someone said it's like it's like reading a history of the bro- the british royalty yeah, you know exactly. who so stabbed I, who who yeah, left so who I, bloody I, on the floor i think you're right i think that uh we don't know where this is going so we, we, we don't know where it's going yeah. but the justice department crawls i mean it moves at a glacial pace and you know and we've always known that as well and also it's you're going to have to really nail it down in a way that has been very hard. In Go to Burge, go to Koshman, go to any number of scandals, and you still haven't gotten into the mayor's office. Yeah. You know, so there is a kind of series of firewalls and plausible deniability that can get in your way on these things. Well, Thelma Louise, now that I have you here, you kind of <laughs> segued into one of my favorite topics. Um, we, as a citizenry, pretty much knew all of this before the election. And um, I'm surprised people are cheering, because people usually get mad at me when I say this. Um, and yet the citizens of Chicago thought it was in their best interest to reelect Rom, just like they reelected Mayor Daley all those times. So what am I going to ask you? Um, is there is there anything left for ba- for Ben to live for? Yeah, that's really, I mean, that's really what the question is. Why do I keep is. doing this? Uh, do, do you think that the, do you think that the public really has turned the corner now? Like they're truly outraged, or do you think that absent of a federal prosecution, absent of like indicting Rom, or even with indicting Rom, they would still reelect him. Well, Let's oh. remember Rod Blagojevich was indicted, and people clustered around the federal building to cheer him as he walked in and out. Yeah. You know, I watched it every day. And so, and Rod Blagojevich, let's remember, got reelected during a federal investigation. <laughs> I, used to, I used to work in Tennessee, where one of my favorite politicians was Tommy Burnett, the plateau in Crossville, Tennessee. Yeah. Tommy got reelected when he was in prison. <laughs> so, so we were actually at higher standard here in so, Chicago. <laughs> so you know, this stuff happens. Yeah. So what are you saying? Uh, <laughs> well, what what about let's? Uh, we want to open up the questions here in a minute. But what about um, seemingly lower hanging fruit and, more, and certainly more immediate um, is the election for state's attorney. Um, and Anita Alvarez have, you know, activists have been out Gross. there. Yeah, I, I really deflated the room, which is the mere mention um, of, of her name. But a lot of activists have been saying, you know, there were three targets. They got rid of Gary McCarthy, Anita, and Rahm are next. So will this actually turn into um, a, a difference at the polls? Is, is, there, is she going to get, get ousted? And I ask this because, you know, my colleagues and I talk and, we still think there's a path to victory for Anita Alvarez. With what three, do you think? with three with on the three. ballot. Yeah. There is a path to victory. I would not count her out. I do think there will be a significant turnout in black wards. Um, and you and she's lost a lot of important Hispanic support. And so could she lose? Absolutely she could. But there's also in this three way split a chance that she won't. But I really do think there will be a turnout. How high a turnout, I don't know, but better than maybe we've seen in a primary before. And and then the other question is, could it also impact the Senate race? You know, might it impact the Tammy Duckworth, um, Andrea Zopp race as well? You know, we'll have to see. All right. 
Uh, anybody have any questions? The first one I saw is in the back. The question is about corruption in the media since we've been talking about it in other institutions. And is that Marty? Is you ask, are you asking the question? Yes. Good to see you, Marty. Thank you for coming out. Um, and, and Marty takes great issue with the, uh, the coverage in particular of... I'm paraphrasing because we're recording this, actually. First of all, it's my show. Second of all, we're recording this. And I'm... I'm I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the question, and others who, thank you. Anyway, the question is about the cover, the reader's coverage of Madison, the Madison Hobley case, um, and you probably heard the details he was, Marty was uh, offering us, but um, it involved uh, a murder and an arson, and also the part you left out, I believe, was allegations of police torture, which I think is why he was compensated um, at, through a, well, he got money from it, okay? So anyway, does anyone want to comment on the, on the question or the issue of, has the media looked the other way? Are we, are we quicker to write about corruption in the police department, in City Hall, um, than issues with coverage in our own ranks? Absolutely we are. Yeah. Of course we are. You know, of course we are, because they are protecting, you know, our safety. And yes, uh, have we looked the other way on things Perhaps I mean I, I I'm no one's perfect. I mean that's not our goal. That's not what we go out set out to do. But to say that to compare uh, looking the maybe not reporting on something that we and comparing what's going on with the city today it, it, it's oranges and apples to me. But you know I think every profession, to some degree or another, has a code of silence. Doctors, lawyers, teachers. reporters, teachers, I think everybody. I think that happens all the time. I remember being in my doctor's office, I had a knee surgery, and I heard him on the other side of the screen talking to a colleague saying, now Bill, why didn't you have your partner do this surgery? I really think, you, you don't want to bother with this. And he went on and on and finally came around to me and I said, he's a bad doctor, right? And the answer was, yeah. Well, we have bad reporters, we have bad priests, we have bad everything. And I do think that it is very hard inside professions for people to rise up and point the finger at someone who is not doing what they ought to do. So yes. Why did no alderman vote against the $5 million settlement in the Laquan McDonald case? And why didn't any, any of the aldermen bring it up as an issue at the time? And why didn't they flag it or bring it up? There were a couple of questions at the Finance Committee. Um, Alter, um, Walter Burnett, not Walter Burnett, um, darn it. No. No. Margaret Lorino did bring. Margaret Lorino, but also Jason Irvin. Jason Irvin and someone else. Uh, Ed Berg said something. There were there were several questions. There were about four or five questions. Margaret Lorino, you're right. And yet they took, as they say, the the Corporation Council advice, who said we should settle this case. Uh, it could be worse. Uh, we need to get rid of it. And you know, because there had been rumors of a 16 million dollar, a million for each shot. So in the Finance Committee, there were a few questions. <laughs> Not a lot, but there were a few. But one of the questions was not, and I think this will change after this. Can I see the video? Yeah. yeah. You know, should we look at this video? Well, okay. In defense of the city council. Brookins. <laughs> Alderman Brookins. <laughs> nice. What? <laughs> Words I've been waiting to say all night. Everyone take a drink on that one. In defense of my... Beloved Alderman, uh, their primary role in that specific vote was to save the taxpayers as much money as they can save. Do you get extra garbage cans for this? No. <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky if I get any garbage cans. So they came to so, tow your car tonight. Oh uh, you're, that, whoever yelled that other point out there, which how much have they saved us ultimately? Ultimately, you could argue that routinely approving settlements in these kinds of cases uh, doesn't act as the kind of deterrent you need to stop these kinds of cases so we don't have to do future payouts. You could make that argument. But in that particular moment, the issue before them was, is this the cheapest way we can get out of this horrendous situation? And their lawyer, 
that's what Steve Patton is effectively their yes, lawyer right. told them trust me take it in so many words if you see this tape you'll know that it's going to cost us a lot more money and so in defense of the city council they just went along with it kind of like a parking meter deal that's quite a like a parking <laughs> meter deal well, we, sh we, well, we, sh no, we no, should. Well, no, 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 I, no. Uh, I cannot allow that one to pass. The parking meter deal, if you spend any time looking at it, would be obviously an incident where the city of Chicago was losing billions of dollars on a crummy deal. This was one where ostensibly we were saving millions of dollars on the deal. So one was, yes, they're the same and that they just blindly did what they were told. Actually, the parking meter deal, they had more dissent. There were five people voting. I was going to say, there were five, five people voting against It's sort of a gold Billy standard. Ocasio. Yeah. yeah, gold standard, five no votes. Five no um, votes <laughs> on a yeah. horrendous deal. So, um, and, and in this case, um, the, the, the lawyers for Laquan McDonald's estate asked for $16 million initially and um, made it very clear in their correspondence with the city that um, when we present this email in this climate with Ferguson and everything that's going on, we think it's going to cost you a lot of money. You're going to get a you're going to get a deal out of this if you settle this before a lawsuit is filed. And so, um, I actually think there's a strong argument to make that uh, just again, I, I agree with Ben that the city council and even the corporation council, in its role um, as looking out for taxpayer interests financially. Um, that they, they did what they were supposed to do. Now, that doesn't get at the broader issues uh, we've discussed here, but I think in that, you know, when they saw it that narrowly, they did what they were supposed to but do. But here's the complicated math of that. The officer had already been settled on for, what was it, $350,000 in a prior case, and there was no consequence in terms of discipline or removal from the force. If the officer, if that had happened, there wouldn't have been a $5 million deal. And so the city council, in raising these questions, and us too, you know, we just can't exonerate ourselves on this, sort of like you say, and who we vote for, how we do what we do, or the voices we don't raise. You know, these have been go these cases, these settlements have been going on for decades. Yeah. And, and, and think, there I hasn't been a, you know, a hue and cry of any size. Sorry to interrupt, but I, yeah, I think I think that you know we have all treated this as sort of this is the way that the that the wheel turns, and I think we those of us who've seen these every month there's there's settlements we look at them and just say well that's kind of a cost of of doing business and and you you kind of move on. Um, one thing I think that for those of you who haven't seen Spotlight, one thing I think that a lot of journalists like about the movie is the fact that it doesn't exonerate the press and it. And it, and it looks at um, sort of what I would call the soft corruption of the media, which is turning the other way and, and allowing things to be brushed under the rug and deciding, well, that's not really a story because that's just the way that it works. Um, or just the, the influence of powerful institutions on the organizations that we work for. Um, or Truth, if you've seen that movie, which is a much more ambiguous ending where the, the reporters may have known the truth, but they didn't have the documents that actually proved it, and they there was a rush to get it on the air within a certain amount of calendar time. And so, I mean, they're both good films to see for those reasons. The question is uh, the, the FBI's potential involvement in the video from Burger King, which had uh, gaps, it turned out that had gaps basically covering the, the whole time of the incident, right? An 87 minute gap, though the cameras were never pointed in a place that would have seen it. We don't know, because here's the thing. Anita Alvarez, in a press conference, said um, they had evidence, credible evidence, that there was no destruction of video. The Sun-Times reported that a source said that the FBI said that they had examined the tape. The FBI hasn't said a word. <laughs> and so, and, and, We've spent a lot of time on this 87 minutes in the Burger King. I was so impressed with the Burger King manager who talked to me with his name. I mean, that doesn't happen very much. And, 
and, and, and, and went through the whole thing. And when you hear the whole thing and say within minutes there are cops, including plain clothes guys who weren't in those cruisers, taking a look at video and then and working for hours, you've got to ask, what, what was that? Now, we still don't know. And it may be that there was some sort of malfunction of, of the equipment, and we can't rule that out. And so you have to be open to it. But, but the FBI has not spoken a word verifying that it was or wasn't erased. The question is, the city is, uh, to, has hired counsel for the Justice Department in inquiry. And, um, and it's a law firm, I think that they're charging, one of the attorneys, I think, I think they said it's like $900 up to like $2,500 or something. He's gonna give a 10% discount. Oh, there you go. <laughs> but it's, it's a powerful connected law firm, right. and uh, the city regularly hires outside counsel, and that, is not a, that does not go through the city council for approval, and frankly, given what we've just been talking about, I'm not sure it would matter if it did. Yeah. But right, but I think they'll argue that for this, they must have attorneys that can work with the Justice Department who are familiar with cases like this and they want to be represented by the best. You know, uh, should they be? You know, that's, I guess, for everyone to decide. I mean, we don't get to decide, but that's what they're going to do. They're going to hire expensive lawyers who they feel will represent them in the best way possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. well, that gets to the issue of who are they representing. Yeah, totally, are they, yeah, totally. That's a very good point. It's sort of like the whole issue of, who are the press aides representing? You know what I mean? They're supposed to be there as, you know, it's a ridiculous thing, but they're supposed to be there to disseminate information about what government is up to, to inquiring citizens and reporters, et cetera, right? And it turns out, as we see by the, that they spent all their time, like a little spin, spinning. spinning. So they should just, I believe they should all be put on Mayor Rahm's uh, campaign. political mm -hmm. campaign payroll, and then we could yeah. spend Same that money. Same thing for the law department. The law department has gone all the way to the Supreme Court to make it impossible for the Office of the Inspector General mm -hmm. to um, look at certain documents because the argument is that anything that involves Steve Patton, the Corporation Council, and the mayor is attorney-client privilege. And there are those, and, 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 and the OIG argue this, the client, they're the taxpayers. Right. The client right. shouldn't be the, the mayor, yeah. but, but the Supreme Court sided with Corporation Counsel. The question is about redacted documents within this, within the 3,000 pages, yeah. as if we didn't have <laughs> enough, uh, you know, we didn't want to read War and Peace three times within it. There was, uh, there were quite a few blacked out um, documents. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, the answer is I don't know why they redacted those. I don't know how they were exempt. I'm not sure. I know that I haven't fought back about, you know, on page 727, <laughs> you black something out, I haven't done it. Um, doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. But, um, you know, they, they really stressed when they were releasing this, you know, we waived attorney-client privilege in a lot of these documents. And, and they, so they sort of, you know, again, even as they're releasing this, this, you know, these hard records, it's in print what was said, what was emailed back and forth. Even, even as they were doing that, they were kind of spinning what it all meant. You know, and, and trying to put the, the best light on it. Like, look, we gave this to you. Look how generous we are. And, it, and it's, you know, I, I appreciate that they actually did do it without a court fight this time. But on the other hand, you know, it was a document dump. And guess what? The law says you have to release it. So it's not an act of generosity to comply with the law in this particular instance. Uh, yeah, well, the, the real answer to your question, I think, is they redact documents because they can get away with it. And uh, they've done that consistently. All of us here have dealt with uh, the city under this administration uh, with redacted documents. And um, I think it's a joke. It's so frivolous. The we can't that get you, the governor's calendar. Yeah, you can't get no, that. That's, that, that's <laughs> a calendar. different administration, which is probably even yeah. worse. I'm, I'm involved in a lawsuit about that particular yeah. issue as well. So yeah. Has the media in this town turned a corner, and why didn't more people look at uh, or do follow-ups on, respond to the uh, Guardian's reporting on Home and Square, which, which um, among other things, alleged basically illegal, that people were illegally detained there for long periods of time at this, at this west side facility? 
Anybody care to yeah, care I, to it does seem as if their folks now have a new sense of purpose of, okay, what else can we find? And Holman Square has clearly been out there for us to take a deeper look at. And so I would hope that that is the case. Um, Carol, maybe you, I don't know what else you would want to weigh in. I think prob one of the problems with the Guardian piece was replicating it, and they called it a black ops site. And it ended up being, it, taking it to a place that I think there was some concern about taking it at face value without doing the same sort of reporting. Just the way a lot of people don't pick up stories that we do because they don't have our documents or they don't have whatever. So, but it, there was more coverage of it than, than just a little, maybe not a lot. But you know, the media, I'll tell you, the media to me doesn't mean much. I mean, the media is not collective. It doesn't move in some sort of, of single direction. There have always been so many different places to find information, but ne not necessarily all collaborated, not all on the nightly news. And so I, I do think we wax and wane. I don't think there's a question about that. I also think that in terms of fighting the fights that Ben's talking about, on FOIAs, you need lawyers. A lot of these operations have been very cut back. The newspapers have, TV has, so you gotta go into court to do those things or get someone to do it pro bono. But, but do I think there's always a sense of outrage and interest among parts of the media? I do. Is it enough to be satisfying every day? No. Let me ask you guys a question that's related to that. Um, do you think that in, in this, this new era, the new energy, the new focus <laughs> the media has in, in Chicago, and, and nationally, I think, too, are we going the other direction? Um, are, are we, uh, you know, is, is every sort of uh, mistake and, and misdeed by the police department or by extension city hall being elevated to a, a much larger, um, you know, a much larger story than it otherwise would be or than it potentially deserves. Do you guys worry about that or think about that at all? I, there, there could be that. I mean, of course, the pendulum swings both ways. But if you also, I hate to keep going back to those emails, but if you ever thought for half a second that perhaps we were being a little too tough on the mayor, <laughs> no. I mean, the emails are such proof of the orchestration, the control, you know, uh, you know, it isn't so much uh, the police. The police department's being run by the fifth floor. Yeah. You know, the law department is being run by the fifth everything. IPRA is yeah. being run by the fifth floor. So, there, keep at it. There's no, there's no way to say, oh, let's back off. The poor mayor's had a tough couple of months. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. On the other hand, there's this. In the course of the Laquan McDonald thing, a lot of us were tapped to go talk to the cables. And so I'd be on some cable show or another. And it would be, when are the riots going to begin? <laughs> and you go, you know, honey, we're hoping there aren't any riots. And, but it's one of those things where I do think small things become magnified, like Donald Trump. Um, you know, in term, <laughs> you know, in terms of they'll stay on for hours on something that's outrageous. And I think all of us have to guard about the sort of hyperbole or the, the focus to the exclusion of other things that need to be looked at. And so I do think sometimes we lose a sense of proportionality. In, in this case, I do think that you can't stop looking at what's happened with Laquan McDonald and all the other other cases and all the emails and the emails we have not yet seen. Yeah. Are, are, all, are all police officers being grouped together in, in the reporting that's happening here? Is it, is it a sort of like the, the police are the bad guys narrative that's going on? Or is that a concern that, it, that um, we're all participating in that kind of a narrative? There is a concern, but here's the other piece of this, and, I, and we all have friends who are police officers and we know the kind of angst that they go through. There are a lot of stories about hero police officers, hero firefighters, people who've done the right thing. Um, and so I think that there is a danger in grouping them. We have to remember that Jamie Calvin and Craig Futterman got tipped from somebody inside, not outside. And so we have to always remember that piece of it too. But sure, there's always a danger well, yeah, of being too uh, generic. 
a de- that's the perfect word, the generic. I feel uh, that we have to be uh, really uh, <sighs> cautious about heading down the path with police that the media and a lot of people uh, did with teachers. And the narrative that was pushed throughout the O's uh, was that the fault with education in uh, basically big cities uh, or throughout the whole country was bad teachers. And if we can only get rid of bad teachers, then miraculously kids from the poorest neighborhood would be scoring as well as kids from um, Mayor Rahm's class at New Trier. And um, uh, I thought that was really unfair and I thought it was inaccurate and I thought it uh, enabled um, the charterization movement to come full force. and. Uh, Uh, our politicians are still saying that. So police have been exempt from that kind of rhetoric. We don't hear about privatizing the police force. We haven't heard any suggestions from anybody saying, let's create charter police stations. (laughs) Uh, Although maybe maybe Rauner is thinking that, and as we speak, (laughs) he can make some money on that one, huh, Bruce? Um, But don't you think we demonize everybody? Doctors are greedy, lawyers are crooks, politicians are all bad. The media is media, 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 media's media's terrible. I mean, media's media's liberal. Media liberal. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> the, liberal media. Oh my God, that's but the I mean, biggest we, joke. We do that. <laughs> no, your point's well taken. It, it, but I, I, I would say that as reporters, we should try very hard uh, to avoid saying what are, doctors are greedy or whatever. Um, some of my best friends are doctors. So, no, I, I think that we have to watch out for that uh, with police as well. We don't head down that road and try to, you know, paint all cops that way. Um, but you've got to crack this situation. We can't have, I mean, we can't allow this to continue. How many millions did you say it was in settlement? 500. Yeah. So. yeah. All right, one more question. The, the role of the media in uh, the way various groups are portrayed, Black Lives Matter, and and, and victims, I would say, of the criminal, you know, participants in or victims of the criminal justice system are usually dismissed as thugs, where, as Marilyn's saying, uh, these separatists or militia group, whatever they are, these are the terms being thrown around in Oregon, um, are are not, are not, those are the terms we're using, right? They're they're very different, described very differently. Any, Any thoughts on this? Multiple. (laughs) <laughs> Multiple. The, uh, I don't agree that all black people are characterized in the media as thugs or terrorists. I think that, and again, it takes me back to this, do we read the New Republic or do we read Bloomberg or The Guardian? You know, there, there are all sorts of different takes. Uh, oh, e- but even mainstream yeah. media. Mainstream media in Oregon or in Arizona. In Arizona, when the Oklahoma City Federal Building was blown up. Some of the coverage and some of the people I talked to said the government deserves it. And these were, you know, these were people who believe that there is too much government. You know, I mean, I think, I I take your point that what's happening in Oregon is, is its own case, but I don't think there is no law enforcement there because they're being tolerated. They're trying to figure out if they're not going to have a ruby ridge. And it's the same reason that Chicago police officers lay back when Michigan Avenue is being protested because don't start something that you can't finish or you don't want to finish. And so, I mean, I think they're complicated. I don't think they're as simple as Black Lives Matters versus what's happening in the standoff in Oregon. Did any of you see the interview, and I didn't, but I've heard about it, of... um, Spike Lee uh, on Meet the Press this week. And I thought, that, you know, what I've heard about it was that he had said, listen, um, you know, where were the protesters when Tyshawn Lee was, it was killed uh, on the south side in the alley? And, and so... You know, some of us were there. We knew where to make the news. Okay. All right. And, and then, that, then we should have covered that. Yeah. Um, so I, I get your point, but I, I, I just hate to see us all put in the same... Summer It's, it's complicated, but it ain't. I think that's a great way to end this evening. All right. Thanks to 
Thanks to, uh, first of all, thanks to all of you. I don't know if Marty stuck around, but I want to thank Marty if he's still here, if anybody knows Marty. All right, well, too bad. Um, but I want to thank everybody, whatever side you are, uh, whether we got it right, we got it wrong. I appreciate your participation and coming out. This is uh, important stuff. And I, uh, even though it's maybe a little weird, I enjoy talking about this stuff and really enjoy talking about you guys. So Marianne and Carol, thank, thank you. you for joining thank us. Thank you very much. And to everybody else, uh, I hope you, we see you guys next month. We'll be here on the first Tuesday of, uh, what is that, uh, February. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good night.